going to, uh, this is going to be the Honey Badger MPC talk of this uh, season. So I'm going to tell you um, about, really this is, the, the point of this talk is to advocate for this new model. It's not even really a new model, but I just think it's underappreciated. And so I'm, I'm trying to pitch uh, this line of work that we've been doing as something that fills a really important gap. And so the main thing to take away from this talk is to try to understand, um, you know, why I think that we need to view a general purpose confidentiality layer is something really important that we should be able to add to our blockchains and why MPC uh, uh, fills that need. Um, there we go. So, um, well, cheesy introduction, but one, you know, uh, I don't, I know you all follow blockchain work and I know a lot of you follow things like zero knowledge proofs as well. Um, I assume that most of you also know that MPC is one of the other huge areas in practical cryptography. So they are having as many cool uh, blockchain or MPC conferences and constant spin of new papers and new projects put on GitHub, really active area, uh, just like blockchain, you know, is, is growing. And while um, the next best comparison really is like zero knowledge proofs. And while there's already this, you know, very clear, you know, overlap all the cool zero knowledge proof people hang out in the blockchain world and vice versa. Um, the same hasn't quite happened with uh, the MPC practical development communities. And clearly there's an opportunity for synergy and more funding and I don't know, to the moon stuff there. So that's one view of why this is a, you know, an important kind of area to try to investigate. Um, in terms of what the you know, complementary strengths are, uh, what we do in the blockchain world and what those folks in the MPC world do, they're actually really nicely um, complementary. So the whole point of the MPC toolkits and applied MPC world is about how to provide this very general purpose way of computing on confidential data. And what the blockchain world focuses on is decentralization, resilience, uh, fault tolerance, keep on going like a honey badger, regardless of failures, hacks, corruptions and such. And so really these are kind of complementary goals because what I will then now argue in kind of like five different ways repeatedly is that um, this notion of fault tolerance and, and you know, robustness is something that's not as highly prioritized in the work in MPC, um, but vice versa, the focus on confidential data isn't something that is as first and foremost uh, a property delivered by most of the blockchain uh, uh, work that we see. So that, that's kind of the, the reason to consider bridging between these um, two communities. So let me try to give my pitch why confidentiality is important and why just throwing zero knowledge proofs at the problem doesn't automatically solve it. And like I think you might get the impression just because um, I think we're starting to, in the blockchain world to understand the application of zero knowledge proofs pretty well. And my argument here is that it's not quite enough. So you know the base level of privacy on blockchains is zero privacy. You just put all of your data in a transaction, put it on chain. And so if you do an auction on Ethereum, it's like you put all of your bids directly on the blockchain, everyone can see it. And obviously that's quite you know, publicly visible. Now, we know that we can get a lot of mileage out of zero knowledge proofs. And in general, the way that you use zero knowledge proofs in a blockchain is instead of putting your secret value X on the blockchain, you put a commitment to X. If you don't know what a commitment is, just think of it as a hash. I think you probably mostly know what commitments are, but um, Anyway, you just put the commitment on chain that doesn't reveal what the secret data is. And then you use your friends, the ZK proofs or ZK smarts to prove that that value you committed to is valid in some way, or it's good in some way, or it doesn't, um, you know, doesn't overspend the amount of balance you have in an account. So that's great. It uses fancy cryptography. It keeps you from having to put the private data on chain while still having some representation of that private data on chain. Now, the limitation is that this falls short of being a completely general purpose smart contract framework for computing on your secret data. And the problem comes in where you can create zero knowledge proofs, but one of the problems with zero knowledge proofs is someone, the prover, has to have the secret data, the witness, to produce that proof. And in this case of an auction where you have two values, just as an example, you know, others are, are like this, but auction's the most uh, kind of easy example where this shows up. Um, you know, the final price of the auction is a function of the secret values of two different bidders, neither one of whom has all the secret information that's relevant, namely they do not have each other's bids. And so you can't just use commitments and zero knowledge proofs to have the blockchain compute what the secret is. 
ways of getting around this, like in Hawk and in kind of other variations of this, might involve revealing what the bids are to a third party or to each other after a commit period. Maybe that's okay for your application, uh, but the point is it involves kind of collecting all of the private information at some third party or central party who can then compute the proof. So, um, you know, you, you see zero knowledge proofs able to accomplish a lot, like you can build Zcash payments out of such zero knowledge proofs, for example, and that works because the person who's the owner of the account and has to authorize the spend, well, that's the person who has all of the relevant secret information uh, so they can make the zero knowledge proof. So just in general, if you have a function that you want to compute that is a function of multiple parties secret data and you don't want to reveal all of that secret data to a single party to make the zero knowledge proof about it, you would have to turn to something else. So what I'm advocating for is um, to think of multi-party computation as this general purpose second layer. You could think of it as a side chain or you could think of it as um, a couple of different ways of viewing it, but um, it's basically a second layer to the public blockchain that is where you store all of your, your secret data. So the public portion of the blockchain is like the bulletin board. It's a broadcast. You put it there, everyone can see it. And whatever are the nodes running the chain, they're you know, keeping it replicated and up to date. And you write smart contracts that are programs that operate on that public bulletin board data. Now, MPC as a side chain or MPC as a confidentiality layer, what that means is that next to the bulletin board, you also have this super secret bulletin board, this MPC bulletin board. And here is where all of the secret data is stored. It's not replicated, it's instead secret shared. So each of the servers has some kind of different uh, portion of the data or some different encoding of the data. It keeps it all secret. I'll mention this more in a little bit. So you have a public layer where you put public transaction data, you have a secret layer where you put confidential data. And just like you have smart contracts that operate on the public layer, like ordinary Ethereum smart contracts or Tezos smart contracts, whatever, you also have MPC programs, which are like the smart contracts that operate on the confidential data. And viewing this as a system, what we you know, care about are applications that have some public components, some private components, and interoperability through some API between them. So that's the kind of high-level vision of you know, where a, a confidentiality layer would fit in. Another way of uh, kind of viewing this is that if you view these kind of two dimensions, like we have Bitcoin, if you extend its programmability, you get all the way to Ethereum and the like, which are fairly flexible. If you add privacy on top of it, you get something like Zcash. And through zero knowledge proofs and other constructions, we can incrementally add more expressiveness and programmability to the private uh, protocols, um, but up to a limit. And again, the argument is that this MPC general purpose layer is what kind of fills that gap of maximum programmability with maximum privacy. Okay, so um, uh, another kind of thing that I want to you know, communicate, especially if you've seen other talks on MPC, there are often two different ways of describing MPC, and the one that I like to describe is MPC as a service. So normally you hear about MPC as a way that different parties with different inputs can run a computation among themselves and get the answer. And what we care about in a blockchain world is where the clients and the servers are kind of separate entities. So I am imagining a permission network where you have a set of validator nodes, blockchain nodes, miners, whatever you want to call them. And they're going to carry out the multi-party computation on behalf of clients who submit the secret shared inputs to them. And then these blockchain nodes will run their joint protocol. They'll publish some output. I'm mostly only going to talk about public output. That's then, you know, goes to everyone. So evaluate some function of all of the parties' inputs. Um, and, and in reality, and I'll say a bit about this later, they have to run this pre-processing thing in the background in order to support their computations on the client data. But I'll come back to this later. Maybe that's a, an implementation detail. Um, the high level idea is this, just if I say MPC as a service, it's like there are your blockchain nodes, same as you're, you're used to thinking about, but now they're carrying out this additional confidential computing service for the clients. Okay. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I would like to give a little bit of background just if anyone has questions about how MPC works and wants to ask them kind of at a time relevant to, um, you know, these couple of slides, then I'd like to, you know, be able to show it and get you all on the same page. Um, actually, I would also like to recommend it Itai Abraham's Decentralized Thoughts blog has a series of blog posts on prime order fields, 
uh, polynomials over prime order fields, and then secret sharing on top of it. And it's just a really beautiful construction. So I don't mind going through it, even though it's pretty standard background by now. But this is one of those things I think everyone in blockchain should know about. Um, so what's a way of encoding secret shared data? Uh, you know you can encrypt data, you know there's public key encryption and symmetric key encryption. Secret sharing is kind of like a third alternative to those. Um, and it's in a sense not really an encryption, but it kind of works like an encryption. You could call it an encoding. Well, there's no other good general name for it, it's just secret sharing. The idea is that you take your secret data and you represent it as the y-intercept of some polynomial, some random polynomial. So that y-intercept is the secret data. And then you have all of your validator nodes they are each going to have a share of the data. And what's a share of the data? It's an evaluation of this polynomial at a different X point, like the X point corresponding to that node's ID. And the idea why this works has to do with polynomial interpolation. You know, if you have any two points, there's like a unique line that goes through them, but like an infinite number of parabolas that go through them. And if you have any three points, you can solve for the parabola. Well, that's kind of what's depicted here. A parabola is a degree two polynomial. And if I have any points from three of these servers, I can interpolate the polynomial that goes through them and then just spit out the y-intercept. I've found the secret data. I've reconstructed it from those three secret shares. On the other hand, if I only have two pieces of data, like two of these nodes have been data breached and their data shows up on the black market or whatever, those two points don't reveal any information about what the secret is. Um, the only way to get really get secret sharing wrong is if you think of secret sharing as each party stores like the first half of the data and then the second half of the data. So everyone has like, you know, the first sentence of your secret email and the second sentence of your secret email. That's not how it works. It's not like the parties each know a portion of the secret data. The idea is that they all know this, you know, share among an encoding of the secret data such that any T of them failing to in this parabola case don't reveal any information at all about what the secret data is. So this is secret share encoding of piece of secret data. It's a really useful thing to know. Now what's cool about secret sharing is that you can do computation on secret data. That's what um, you know, matters for this. So first of all, there is a method of doing reconstruction. I won't go into how it works, but it's a pretty cool protocol for doing um, efficient reconstruction in a batch. It's like the amount of bandwidth and computation is, the amount of bandwidth is like six X expansion uh, per node that's participating. So like a constant factor of overhead per party in the network. Um, and you can do linear, like the secret share encoding is preserved under linear operations. So you don't even have to do any work. You just like take your share of one piece of data X and you take your share of another piece of data Y. If you want the secret share encoding of X plus Y, you just add up your shares because adding of polynomials respects pointwise addition of the points on the polynomial. And then nonlinear operations, like multiplication, for example, that's where all of the um, challenge comes in. And so one way of doing a multiplication of secret share data is called beaver triples. This is the one we use in Honey Badger MPC. Um, and I won't go, I guess, through what the algebra is, but if anyone's interested in this or wants to see it, it's super pleasing. I really got hooked on this kind of techniques once I saw how this works, and I, I don't know, haven't looked back since. You basically reveal by public reconstruction a masked version of the data that you want to multiply together. And then you turn what looked like a nonlinear operation into linear operations of these masked values. And it's just a really cool technique. The, the reason why multiplication is difficult is that if you have a degree T polynomial and another degree T polynomial, if you add them, everything's still degree T. You can still reconstruct it the same way. But if you multiply two degree T polynomials together, you get a degree 2t polynomial. And that sucks, you can't do anything with it because it's just increased your reconstruction threshold. You might not have enough parties or it cuts into your fault tolerance. Um, there is a caveat here, and this is relevant to the blinder work, which is really cool, which is that if you are willing to extend your fault tolerance out a bit to a quarter of nodes being tolerated bad rather than a third of nodes being tolerated bad, then you can handle a degree 2t polynomial. You just have to fix it after that. But um, I probably won't say more about that for here. Um, if anyone has any questions on the secret sharing or the, you know, what you can do with secret shared data, I'd be happy to answer those kind of around now, because um, I'm going to try not to do too much other, you know, technical portions uh, uh, throughout this talk. Um, and my goal would be that everyone, you know, understands the, this portion really well. 
Um, but you'll have time to buffer such questions because I'm going to talk mostly about slightly less technical things um, for the next little while here. So we've been working on this project for quite some time. I think this is, again, the third uh, consecutive year of Honey Badger MPC updates on where we are. And so my goal through this talk is to give you, you know, a little bit of recap on what we've done so far, but also highlight some of the ongoing and new work that we've done. Um, so we have been basically building this MPC toolkit that is custom geared towards blockchain integrations and then trying to fulfill that vision of blockchain confidentiality layer by releasing the code, releasing examples of applications using it, and working on blockchain integration. So uh, we have an Ethereum blockchain integration that you can find from that link. This is what we are using in our Honey Badger MPC hackathon project, which you'll get to see a neat presentation about on um, Saturday. It's like... Uh, putting the crypto back into CryptoKitties. It's one possible tagline for our project. Uh, we also have a kind of in progress integration with Hyperledger Fabric as well. We call it Cloaking Fabric. Uh, for more info on that, I'm not gonna say much more about it here. You can read Rahul Mahadev's master's thesis. There's also some code release that's been contributed by uh, Yunshi and uh, Nurla from my group. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this, but um, what I'd really like to just kind of whet your appetite about, and maybe in our hackathon project, we can say a little bit more about it. Or no, actually, I think on Friday, Sylvain is going to give you a little more of a deep dive into this. So I am giving a forecast for uh, uh, what Sylvain will talk about. But we've been working on integrating the MPC programming model into smart contracts. So this is a snippet of code from the Rattel language. Rattel is like the genus or species name for honey badger. So that's the uh, overlap there. And um, this is basically, we, we figured out how to take the Viper language for Ethereum, which is Python based. And we write our MPC code in honey badger MPC in Python. And so we found a way to basically trick the compiler for Solidity or for Viper contracts on Ethereum to also accept MPC programs. And the compiler just kind of splits out them out into different components. Um, so the idea is that you can write one big page of code with some ordinary Ethereum smart contract functions and also some MPC smart contract functions, and you can do the interoperability of calling one from the other, and the compiler is supposed to just um, spit that out. I'll mention a little bit about applications of Honey Badger MPC with um, some links or at least keywords where you can go find them. Um, the asynchromix uh, mixing application, that was the one that we presented on on CCS. And um, Blinder is a really cool paper with some neat techniques um, that's pretty closely related. It does a lot better on performance, but the way it gets the better performance and availability guarantees does hinge on having a different fault tolerance threshold. But you can read those in successive CCS years. I'll say a little bit about this distributed proofs of retrievability, because this was an idea that we got from Dankred at Ethereum Foundation. And it was really fun to basically respond to an F research uh, post and show how to use Honey Badger MPC to um, answer a question that was posed there. Last hackathon, we also had a volume matching auction. We have some slides on that you can follow. Um, I don't think that I have um, slides about this, but I'd encourage you to ask Yun Chi Lee about the supply chain tracking application. And Ari yesterday mentioned a bit about Candid, how Honey Badger MPC, you know, MPC in general, can be used as fuzzy deduplication in a decentralized identity application. I see a question that um, popped up responsive to me asking for questions about, um, uh, about this. This is actually about input masks. So I, will, um, I didn't show anything about input masks. So I will, I will get to that in a couple of slides. Um, before answering the question on input masks, let me just highlight a bit this um, distributed proof of custody application because it's, um, it, it, I just would like to draw attention to it. I think it's cool and you might not have seen it before. So distributed proof of custody, this is where you want to prove to someone that you've seen a file, like this is a protocol for block availability, like you want a bunch of people in order to get a reward to show, yeah, they've actually seen and downloaded and therefore are responsible for you know, later sharing or validating a block of data. And you basically, the, the proposal to do that is you have that, that person who is trying to prove they have the data, they have a secret key, and they're going to evaluate a pseudo random function on a combination of that data and the secret key. And like, it's hard to outsource by like, giving away your secret or not actually having the data, but computing this function on it. And if you want someone to be to distribute their work to make it um, like I have several different copies, and I still want to get my reward and not get busted and have my collateral slashed if one of them fails, and I'm 
you know, responsible and make a bunch of backups, and I want to secret share this across um, my different backups, then it becomes a question of, can I use MPC to, in a distributed way, compute my proof of custody response um, without having my secret be just replicated on all of them. I want to allow one of the nodes to get compromised or damaged and still not risk having my collateral slashed. So this was basically you know, proposed as something on the F Research Forum. And then you know, what we showed is how to use uh, Honey Badger MPC in order to you know, fulfill the distributed computation of this proof of custody. Um, so it's a little bit tricky to um, you know, go through this in, in more detail. Uh, so I think I will probably just leave this there and say this is an example of something that you can read a little bit more about what uh, Amit wrote about it on the F Research Forum. Um, another just quick foreshadowing of some you know, ongoing work. Um, there are a lot of different techniques. There's commitment, zero knowledge proofs, like I mentioned. So this suggests that we should have a flow chart that you can use in order to tell if you need an MPC. You don't always need an MPC. Um, the flowchart is, this was our first version of the flowchart and we're working on a more nuanced version. Um, an incrementally more nuanced version is this one. This is still a work in progress though. Um, but I like the idea that you should be able to describe the components of your application and your application needs and at the end of the flowchart kind of identify the uh, uh, best set of techniques that you could use. So I won't go into more detail on this, but I'd encourage you to ask Yunchi uh, about it. Um, we're basically building a bunch of different related applications and showing what's the appropriate choice of fancy cryptography for each one of these variations. Okay, so um, the rest of my talk, I am going to just nitpick and rant about some tiny aspects of security models that no one will care about. Or if I'm just get riled up about it, then maybe you'll care about it just through sheer force of charisma or something like that. So really these are all about improving the security model and robustness model of MPC. I like calling things honey badger of whatever, and then that forces you to consider, well, what is the most robust thing you could possibly get out of your given setting? So what counts as the honey badger of MPC? It should tick all of these boxes for you know, best possible security guarantees. So the first portion, I'll remind you of what we did with the Honey Badger MPC in our CCS paper, Robust Asynchronous MPC. And then what I'll try to spend more time on is our ongoing work on publicly auditable MPC. Um, so I'll try to go through this because you may have seen it before. And if not, um, I don't know, you'll have to look at it for the slides. I want to save room to talk about the new work, so I won't spend as much time on this. Um, the basic story here is robustness. And this is again where the predominant direction in the MPC community differs from the values of the blockchain community. So normally in MPC, you want your integrity guarantees and your confidentiality guarantees. If you have a node failure, you're not gonna get wrong data as output, and you're not gonna lose the confidentiality of your data. That's great. Um, and if you're a MPC person, that's usually where the story ends. Um, but in blockchain, we care about robustness, right? So the reason why you don't get wrong data is because you don't get any data at all. Like the process just stops. You're not going to get your computation if even one of the nodes fails and you use um, you know, most of the MPC toolkits that are available. So I would call this fragile MPC. Uh, it doesn't have availability guarantees, even though it has the privacy and integrity guarantees. But in the blockchain world, that's not enough. We have BFT consensus protocols. We care all about the high availability even if some of the nodes fail. And so this whole point of um, you know, this work is about reconciling those two um, goals. Like we want the MPC system to keep working even if some of the validator nodes fail. Uh, I'm gonna kind of narrow in on this point in a couple more ways. Um, I mean, the first one, this is a subset of the comparison chart from our CCS paper. This is like a survey of the robustness or availability guarantees of all of the MPC toolkits that are available and it's like a ghost town. None of them check any of the boxes. Basically, none of them express the high availability as a goal. Uh, it's not like they're defective and they, they forgot about it. It's just not one of their stated goals. Um, but if you want a blockchain confidentiality layer, it makes sense you want this guaranteed um, availability. And a caveat is that I mentioned there's an offline phase. We only get robustness for the online phase. So fill in that little missing circle in the bottom right there is um, ongoing work. Um, there's a, an inherent trade-off, and this is, I think, the best explanation of why the MPC community has a good reason not to try to aim at this robust availability. And the reason is that the um, preferred model of MPC is called dishonest majority, which means you get your integrity and 
confidentiality guarantees, even if all but one of the validator nodes is bad. That's like the best possible thing you could get. Like all N would have to be data breached at the same time for your confidentiality to be lost. Now in BFT protocols, even if you don't care about privacy, we are kind of resigned to accepting 51% attacks. Uh, in other words, we need a majority honest assumption. So we don't get any of our guarantees, let alone privacy, um, if more than a third of the nodes are bad in, in a partially synchronous setting. So you have to talk the MPC folks out of the dishonest majority setting if you want to get the BFT style availability. And so that's where the setting where Honey Badger MPC lives in and other honest majority MPC, you know, if they add robustness can fit in there too. Um, so again, this is saying we are offering privacy guarantees in the same conditions that you'd normally get availability and integrity guarantees in your BFT protocol. But we're not getting as strong confidentiality guarantees as the uh, state of the art MPC, but this is like an inherent compromise that um, you have to be able to make. Uh, one of the other points that we make in our paper is that it's not, you, there is this kind of weird difference. Like, so here's a lot of protocols that have black dots there indicating that they do have availability guarantees compared with this middle section with no dots there. So what's the difference? These ones in the top that have those check boxes, those are protocols that are not implemented in open source toolkits or even closed source toolkits as far as I know. Whereas the ones that don't have those check boxes, those are all the things you can find on GitHub. So what this is saying is that we know in theory how to get robustness for MPC, um, but it just hasn't made its way to the implementation applied MPC folks. Now, we added this extra extension to it um, to look at you know, it's not just a matter of picking any one of these protocols and then implement it, and now you've got your robust um, MPC. And the reason why is really about this notion of asynchronous safety and liveness. So the way that most of these protocols guarantee robustness is you identify a failed player, and then you kick them out, and then you like redo the computation with that player removed. And now one of the ways you can kick out a player is by timing them out. But if you use a timeout to kick out a player and then do resharing of the data with a lower threshold because you kicked out one of the players, now you've introduced a potential network condition that feeds back into your privacy condition. Like if some node is temporarily offline or there's a network partition, you might kick them out and then lower your fault tolerance threshold among the remaining runs. In other words, in an asynchronous network, you may now lose your confidentiality guarantees that you started out with. So that's the significance of this asynchronous safe um, column. And now if you look at the ones that satisfy asynchronous safe, they either have a complicated um, cryptography to implement, like somewhat homomorphic encryption, or they need to compromise on the fault tolerance threshold, like going down to n over four rather than n over three. And so this was one of the reasons why our choice of protocols was more constrained than it might seem. And I'm not going to talk about how you know, our, our protocol differs. I just wanted to kind of highlight these uh, you know, different kinds of security goals that you might aim to get through MPC. Here's another way that I like to view asynchronous safety uh, as, a, as a backup guarantee. So a lot of times when you're discussing subtle security details, it's tricky because you need to talk about two layers. Like you get some guarantees under setting A, and you get other guarantees in setting B. And the best way to describe this is graceful degradation of service. Like you get all of your guarantees no matter what when, uh, when the network is synchronous. So in this case one, the network is synchronous. You get all of your guarantees, liveness, availability, integrity. And you get this even if you have an asynchronous safe or unsafe protocol because while the network is fine, there's no difference between those. But what you get by having an asynchronous safe protocol is backup guarantees. If the network has an asynchronous period, like messages are being dropped or it's just slower than you expect the network to be normally, well, you might not get liveness, that's kind of inherent, um, but you could still aim to preserve your integrity and confidentiality guarantee, but you only get that if you choose an asynchronous safe protocol. So if you wanna be able to offer backup guarantees like this, it further constrains the choice of uh, protocol components that you can use. Okay, so, um, I'll just say again, and then I'll answer the question that was posed, you know, as, as an overall, you know, flow, how does the Honey Badger MPC system work? Well, again, it's a system for a permission network. We try to aim for large networks, meaning up to 100 servers. I could say more about sharded MPC as a way of trying to get more scalability than that, but let me just say, you know, up to 100 servers. 
they're continuously generating these pre-processing data, which are like random secret shared values that you use as masks and that you use for beaver multiplication. These are just running in the background. The point is they don't depend on user input. So you can imagine them having to build up a buffer of like a month's worth of random masks before the service turns on. And that way, you know, they have like a month leeway even if some of the nodes are crashing. Uh, then there's a process by which clients can input their secret data into the system. Then there is a process for using a blockchain to decide on, okay, whose inputs are available, who's authorized to provide inputs to a given application, um, and basically it's the coordinator, like it is starting the MPC, it's the MPC is running off chain, and then the results of the MPC are written back to the chain. And so then the blockchain marks, yes, the MPC is complete, this output is available. So basically it's a blockchain acting as a coordinator. And then the result is that we have some output that's a function of all of the secrets that are input. So those are the phases. And um, I, I'm not gonna try to go over all of these because I'd rather talk about um, the newer, uh, ongoing work, but I do want to describe the input process just because I think it's kind of interesting. This isn't new. I, I first saw this in the Speeds paper, or the first of it, which is now, you know, more than a decade old. Um, but I like describing this input mask problem. So you can't just rely on clients to send secret shares because the secret shares might be on a wrong degree polynomial. Like if you just have random values, they aren't in general on a low degree polynomial, they're just on a you know, n values would be on an n degree polynomial in general. So uh, there's an approach called verifiable secret sharing. That's actually something you use polynomial commitments and uh, commitments and zero knowledge proofs in general for, but that can be kind of expensive. So a lighter weight alternative, which is really cool, is based on input masks. So the idea is that the servers, I already told you, they're in the background generating these random secret shares. So we saw that some of these random secret shares are input masks. And what we do is the blockchain authorizes individual parties to get a single input mask to use for their input. And what they do is once they're authorized, they ask those server nodes to send them all of their shares of the input mask. So now this value R, the client knows it, it's their input mask, the servers just have their secret shares of R denoted by the little square brackets. What the client does is now publishes on the blockchain or any other way you can think of, but they publish their masked input, like their secret X plus R. Um, and what the servers can then do is simply subtract their secret share of R from that public mask value, and now they have the secret share of X, which is what we wanted. And so we basically shifted the burden of making valid secret shared data from the clients. They can publish anything they want. Uh, we've shifted that burden or that trust assumption really back to the servers where we had to have that trust assumption anyway. So now the servers generate the secret shared data, which isn't changing the trust model, it's inherent. And now we don't have to do verifiable secret sharing for the clients. So the question specifically was, you know, are these masks different in each mask request or can you, you know, reuse them or something? And yeah, these are consumables, which is why you need this buffer of them. Like you use this input mask once, it's unsafe to use it again. Like you use it for this input and then throw R away. You can't use it for anything else again. Um, and that's important because the reason why this is secure is that this doesn't reveal any information about X as long as it isn't used for anything else. So hopefully that's a good answer to that, that question. Okay, um, there's more details in the slides and in the paper about how all this works. Um, we put a lot of effort into tuning the parameters so that you can do other kinds of cryptography on them. Like we are basically using the jub jub uh, base elliptic curve so we can do jub jub elliptic curve operations within MPC and it's FFT friendly. Um, we have some examples of this used, but I, I probably won't say more about that for now to save some time. And I've already mentioned enough about how the blockchain as a coordinator works, but I'm happy to take more questions about, you know, what it means to use blockchain as an MPC coordinator. So I have just enough time to say a bit about um, the ongoing work that I wanted to uh, really focus on. So things that we are continuing to work on are further examples of improving the security models and uh, trying to do other kinds of application and scalability improvements to this blockchain as an MPC, or MPC as a blockchain confidentiality layer. Um, sharded MPC, robust offline phase, those are two things that are, are on our, in our ongoing work, but I wanna talk about this uh, work on publicly auditable MPC. I actually won't be able to point you to a preprint for it right now, but I'm expecting to have it online within not more than one week, hopefully by this weekend. So this is some ongoing work that um, 
just have to take my uh, uh, word for it and I'll tell you a bit about it, but it is basically, uh, one way of thinking of it is what do you get when you combine Marlin zero knowledge proofs with multi-party computation? Um, and what you get is publicly auditable MPC with universal trusted setup. And I'll try to go into a little more detail in explaining why you need this. And I'll, I'll give the answer again in the form of a kind of backup guarantee. So you get all of your properties regardless of which MPC you use when not too many of the nodes are corrupted, right? Like I mentioned, honest majority MPC means it works when a majority of the nodes are honest. What happens if all N of the nodes are dishonest? Even if you're using dishonest majority MPC, if all N of the nodes are bad, then you don't get any of your guarantees. Now, a publicly auditable MPC gives you this you know, when I, I show it in a chart like this, it looks like a pretty meager guarantee. Like it's saying that here's a quadrant where you aren't getting confidentiality. So in a sense, the secrets are leaked, right? So if that's your biggest concern, this isn't doing anything for you. And you aren't even guaranteed to get any output at all. But what we are aiming to offer is that you should get this backup integrity guarantee, even in the case that all of the server validator nodes have gone corrupt in some way. To put this into context, um, one of the applications that we care about is a digital asset exchange or a digital asset auction. What does an integrity guarantee mean in a digital asset auction? Well, you know, the inputs to an auction are all of these bids and you might wanna check that all of the parties are not bidding value that they actually have on whatever underlying digital currency, cryptocurrency you're using as a, as a, as a digital asset ledger. So, you know, availability, if availability goes away, maybe you're not getting your auction results. Confidentiality goes away, maybe you're revealing what your bids are. What does it mean if the integrity guarantee doesn't hold? Well, if the integrity guarantee doesn't hold, it means the corrupt servers might just be printing their own money. Like, not only might they be, you know, keeping someone out of the auction or, you know, changing who's the winner of the auction, you might be relying on them to even report on the total amount of money that comes back. Um, so, if you really care about your, your integrity guarantee for like conservation of balance, that's an example where you really want this integrity guarantee, even if all of the server nodes are bad. I would also say that um, we've been working really hard on this since last year's bootcamp because this was something else suggested by Dunkrad. He was helping on our MPC project last time and said, well, you know, this kind of sucks because your volume matching auction might be inflating money and you can't prove it's not. How could you get this? And, and this was actually our inspiration to uh, keep cracking at this problem. So in a nutshell, publicly auditable MPC combines MPC with zero knowledge proofs. So the high level view, uh, regardless of what protocol you use for it, is something like this. You have your public bulletin board, you have your MPC confidentiality layer, but you don't just trust the MPC nodes to write back the result of a computation, what you do is have the users providing inputs put their commitments to their inputs, their commitments to their account balances, bids, uh, what have you, onto the public blockchain. And they include zero knowledge proofs that their commitments are to valid balances or valid bids not exceeding their balance. And now when the MPC confidential layer computes its output, it doesn't just say, trust me, I'm a majority quorum of MPC nodes. Uh, they actually have to produce a snark proof about the computation that they did and they put it to the bulletin board along their actual result. And you can view this as an auditing protocol. I, we're, we're labeling it with an auditor, but if anyone can run it, it's like a public coin audit protocol. If you want to check this as valid, you just look at all the input commitments, you look at the output commitment, those are your statement to a zero knowledge proof, then you check the zero knowledge proof that came along with it. And if the, you know, Zero knowledge proof checks out, you know that these are all commitments to consistent values. Um, you know, so the components of this, the auditability and efficiency, those come from using an efficient SNARK. The you know, S and SNARK is for awesome and fast and succinct. Um, and the privacy component comes because you're only putting commitments on chain and the MPC nodes are keeping the data confidential as well. So there's a very intuitive way of how you can do this. And if you don't care about the succinctness, you can do this kind of the brute force way with Peterson commitments, but it, auditing then is really slow and the amount of data you have to put on the blockchain is quite a lot. So we don't wanna use that, we wanna use a snark. Now there's lots of choices of snarks. Um, and in particular, we care a lot about where the trusted setup from snarks comes from. And uh, we stole this idea from one of Mary Muller's slides, but you know you can think of an SRS or a 
Groth 16 or Pinocchio style setup as being specific to the application you're doing, whereas a universal reference string is the one-time trusted setup. It doesn't, you can reconfigure it for whichever application you want without having to go redo the trusted setup. So if we want this general purpose blockchain confidentiality layer, you don't have to go want to go to the founders and restart the blockchain every time someone has a new smart contract idea. That doesn't count. Uh, we really need a universal reference string for this to be a plausible general purpose platform like I've been pitching so hard. So it's not super trivial to do this, um, combining MPZ and zero knowledge proofs. It's fun. It doesn't, um, it's not maybe as hard as you might worry that it is. They actually do fit together quite nicely, but there's a lot of components that you have to check out, especially to fix the security definitions and try to make um, a proof that goes all the way through. Um, so, you know, there's a project called Lego Snark, which is a really nice way of viewing the different building blocks that go into um, Snark constructions. Um, most Snarks are built on polynomial commitments. And what we found was necessary to make this go through is to use polynomial evaluation commitments, a new primitive that's a variation of polynomial commitments. That's what I'll talk about in the next slide. And that'll be the only other technical thing I try to do in this talk. And, uh, and, and then the, the final step is to basically provide a way of generating the snark proof um, using an MPC operation. And um, if I were going to use Mary, Mary Mahler's notation, I would say this um, is efficient because it doesn't rely on an NP reduction. Like you can obviously throw MPC at any problem generically, but the generic version would be super slow converting to bits and Boolean gates and stuff. So the point is to have an MPC protocol that nicely meshes with the underlying snark protocol. So let me describe what polynomial evaluation commitments are. And this may give you some intuition of what kind of challenges we face and what it looks like to try to adapt Marlin so that you know, Marlin's the snark that we started with. It's one of the snarks that has a universal common reference string. So the goal is to basically compute Marlin proofs from within MPC. Now, the way that you compute a Marlin proof to zoom out at a very high level, this is you know, partially accurate, but it kind of gives you a flavor of it. In a nutshell, the way a Marlin proof works is it's based on polynomial commitments. So what you do is you take your prover, it's the prover there, he has the witness X, and he has the reference string for, uh, you know, the universal reference string may be customized to the circuit he's going to do. And he takes his circuit and his statement data and his witness data, and he packs it all into a polynomial. The different color stripes of the polynomial there are like the different evaluation points of the polynomial. Then he creates a polynomial commitment, and we all use our favorite KZG style poly commit scheme. So it's constant size, really uh, tiny and quick to check. It's like one point kind of indicated there. And then once you have your commitment, you do some fiat shamir on it, you get a random challenge, and then you prove that you can open that polynomial to a given point and reveal that point. It's indicated by the little target reticle there. And in a nutshell, you package up the commitments you use and the evaluations you use, and you do many more layers of this in the actual protocol. But in a nutshell, that's what the verifier ends up checking, some poly commits and some evaluations on the polynomial and proofs about it. Now, in our setting, um, we don't have a prover who knows the whole witness. The witness consists of components that only different input parties know. And the MPC nodes who are going to compute this only have shares of all of those witness value. So what we essentially need is a way of computing a polynomial commitment from many different disjoint uh, provers, all of whom make a commitment to their individual inputs. So in a sense, it's like a polynomial interpolation commitment, or you call it a polynomial evaluation commitment. So you have commitments to the individual input values that will form the basis of the polynomial. Then we have a routine to merge them into a single KZG style poly commit, and then a way that we can compute responses to the challenge queries from within all of those MPC nodes. And in a sense, like if you buy that this top level shows, you know, um, top half of the slide shows what's needed in Marlin, then you, know, you can maybe understand the bottom half of the slide illustrates what you need for MPC version of Marlin. Um, the construction isn't that complicated or that not that much different than KZG to make the you know formal security definitions work essentially the definition stays nearly the same like your setup routine open routine check routine those are all intact um, but what we have to do is split up the process of committing to a polynomial into two parts so first you commit to the evaluations first 
and then you interpolate all of those evaluation commitments into a single polynomial commitment. And there are a couple of wrong ways you could do this. And so in, in our paper that is upcoming, uh, you'll find it on a preprint server soon. Um, we have three different variations of how to do this. One is based on Peterson commitments, but it still is a succinct one. It's not, um, it's not uh, somehow non-trivial how you use Peterson commitments and you get a KZG commitment as a result of interpolating them. There's also one that is based on Lipma commitments, like each party makes a commitment to a Lagrange polynomial evaluation associated with their secret point. And then there's also a batch version of the above. And these all give sort of different performance guarantees. The performance criteria depend on how many different parties, distinct parties are providing input and how large those inputs are. So like in an auction, if a party just does a bid, that's maybe a small value. But if different parties are going to provide a big vector of inputs, there's other opportunities for batching and amortization. And those are all things that we explore in our benchmarks and evaluating these different alternative ways of implementing it. Um, we have an implementation in, in the preprint. I would rather save more room for questions. So I'm not even going to try to explain you know, what these graphs are indicating. But in a nutshell, well, here's the main point to take away from this. Um, it's not as much overhead as you might think. The, the whole point is that we, we found a way of computing the Marlin proofs in MPC in a way that very naturally fits on top of Marlin. So it's not a whole lot of extra overhead. It's not like a big expensive MPC protocol with a lot of communication. Like the additional communication cost is roughly uh, constant because it's just the um, it's just the kind of like the hash of the final challenges or the only the succinct polynomial commitments that you have to reconstruct and then the challenges on them can be computed um, publicly. So compared to non-auditable MPC, making auditable MPC doesn't cost you that much. Like whatever your cost of MPC is, you might as well attach a zero knowledge proof to it. You, you get this additional guarantee for not a whole lot of extra overhead. Um, there are a lot of caveats in like the programming model of working with this. Well, uh, yeah, I, I won't say more about what the costs are. You'll be able to look at our charts in our upcoming paper. Let me wrap up by identifying, you know, some open questions associated with this, and then I'd be happy to talk about it a little bit more. Um, we started from a paper called Adaptive uh, Pinocchio or uh, Trinocchio and Adaptive Trinocchio. I think those are really cool underrated papers. I think everyone should know about the publicly auditable MPC um, you know, framework, just that this is possible. You can combine your zero-knowledge proofs in MPC, and you probably should. Uh, in this related work, which I think is just underappreciated related work, it focused on Pinocchio-style ZKPs, um, which have that you know, structured, trusted setup you can't re repurpose for a different application. And in our work, we tried to show you can do this for Marlin, like you can make a MPC version of Marlin, and then that's a good fit for the blockchain confidentiality layer. But there is a ton of ongoing work. You heard, uh, you know, Mary talk about some different versions of these as well. And I see some of the questions lighting up about why not Libra, why not Plonk, why not uh, Groth16 or Snark of your choice. I think in principle, all of these could be made MPC in some way. I think it's a question of whether or not some of these may be you know, less applicable to MPC. My guess is that the biggest challenge is in making ones um, based on unknown order groups compatible in MPC. To me, that's the biggest open question. I think it would mostly be procedural to take any of the others and turn it into an MPC version of it. So why not have publicly auditable MPC based on you know, any SNARK protocol? I think it would be neat to make a generic solution there. But again, we've just kind of uh, tailored ours to Marlin but others are possible as well. Um, I mentioned that there are some trade-offs about how you combine commitments from different parties. So performance depends on how many input parties there are and how large their inputs are. There's still some room for improvement. Like it would be nice to use a roll-up like technique so that the auditor can be faster somehow, even if a lot of people are merging their inputs all into one. And finally, um, I care a lot about programming models for MPC and smart contracts and ZKP. And it's hard enough to you know, combine smart contract and MPC programming. We really need now, and MPC and SNARK programming, we really need like all three. And what happens is that even though SNARKs kind of natively use R1CS constraint systems, MPC you know, co does compute forward, like it can compute any like if you the simplest way is to start with an arithmetic circuit and then you can make an R1CS from an arithmetic circuit and you can make an MPC program for an arithmetic circuit. But if you start with a constraint system or you start with an MPC program, 
um, you can do things that you are optimizations that aren't available to you if you just started with an arithmetic circuit. So there's a question of like, how best do you want to write your program so that you can get all the op optimizations you want for the MPC part and all the optimizations you want for the ZKP part and merge them somehow. And that is just totally not obvious how to do. So those are, I think, the um, open questions remaining in how to do practical publicly auditable MPC. I think I, I, I think I don't have any, yeah, everything else is just other stuff that's there. So I'm um, happy to take questions on this. This is our you know, current uh, uh, set of stuff that we're working on to advance Honey Badger MPC. And I would encourage you to, among other things that I encourage you to do, be sure to, to listen to Sylvain's talk that's kind of the systems integration side on you know, merging the programming models of these. So um, yeah, I will pause there and um, see if anyone wants to ask questions. And I don't mind fielding questions from myself, for myself. Um, let's see, so I wanna try to answer this one. So like Alex asks, although robustness is guaranteed, is there a risk of the secret inputs being discovered if um, you know, they're mal malicious? Yeah, so that, and this is exactly the way that I would like to talk about this because um, I'd rather talk rather than about protocol details, I would like to talk about um, you know, security guarantees that you are offered. So this question is saying, in the case that a lot of the nodes are corrupted, would you rather, I, I'm saying that with publicly auditable MPC, you can get your integrity guarantee, but throw away confidentiality and availability. And in um, robust MPC, back to this slide, I am saying that, well, we can, using honest majority MPC, we can guarantee availability, uh, you know, in the case that most of the nodes are okay, but all of the guarantees, you know, except integrity, if you use snarks, go away when more than a third of the nodes are corrupt. Can you, if you would rather have, if you would only want to have malicious nodes be able to break liveness and integrity maybe, or, you know, you could get integrity from the snark, but if you want to, if you would rather have better confidentiality guarantees and throw away the liveness guarantee, then yeah, you would be better off. You can get that. That's a fine choice to make. I would say that's a more, you know, common and traditional choice to make. So you're in very good company if you decide that's the setting that you would want. In that case, what you would be wanting is the N out of N secret sharing. So like you could use M MP speeds is one of the toolkits available or scale Mamba. There are several and you would want to use one of the N out of N secret sharing configuration modes for that. So this is really a question on like, do you, would you rather have robustness for availability or for the confidentiality? Uh, Itai asks, who will be the servers running the MPC and how will you guarantee that you don't just select, you know, different uh, sybils of the same you know, of the same uh, person who's all doing this. I, I, I really have no idea. I think this is a good kind of practical open question and I don't have a great uh, answer for it. I mean, I would like to say you can just pick nodes from public validator set, like all the stakers and have them do it. But I kind of think that that's not a good choice. Here's the best reason. The concern about um, like, if you pick nodes at random from a set of people who have a you know, stake bond and ask them to do consensus, if they fail to do consensus, you can tell that they failed. And so you can just slash them and take their stake away or you know, do any other kind of number of things. Like you can reject them because it's evident that they, at least as a group, didn't you know, succeed at what they were supposed to do. The problem with MPC is that if what you care about is confidentiality, there's no way that you can tell whether or not they've secretly leaked the data. Like if it shows up, on a black market somewhere, all of the bids from MPC based exchange from 2021, like that all shows up in a black market on 2022. Then you knew that those nodes were bad. If they still have stake on deposit, maybe you could punish them then. Uh, but if they just leaked the data to like a spy agency or something, you're not really guaranteed that you find out or that you can prove that they are uh, corrupted or that they did that. So it's hard to punish them for it. So that's a reason why I think it's most likely that MPC as a blockchain layer is most applicable to permission networks where there is a higher degree of trust or you know, some kind of identity associated with the nodes who are participating. I think it's much more challenging to try to say, this is something you can do in public or from public nodes. One countermeasure to that might be to combine MPC with trusted enclaves, for example, that would give you the maximum amount of backup guarantees. And I think that's a, a you know, potential good solution for that. 